I'd like to uh, start tonight with a little bit of a confession, and some of you might judge me for this. I don't love Christmas songs. Scrooge? Ooh. Here's what I mean by that. I, I think some Christmas songs are cheesy. Anyone? I feel really alone right now. <laughs> like, I hear no one being like, they're just like, oh my gosh, a pastor doesn't like Christmas songs. Um, I have three albums I listen to. My wife got me converted to Bing Crosby's Christmas album. It's good. I love Neil Diamond's Christmas album. A Jewish man wrote a Christmas album. Go figure, but it's great. And then the third one, Charlie Brown Christmas, kind of jazz. Good to put it in the background as you decorate the tree. Everything else, in my opinion, is cheesy. If you want to convert me to your favorite, send me an email. Give me a copy. I'll listen to it. But here's kind of my deal. Um, I remember my mom's pet peeve was that song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. She just thinks Christmas isn't little, right? It shouldn't be little. It should be big. I agree with my mother. Um, but I think the great Christmas songs proclaim something. They say something big. They say something significant, a, a real, in my opinion, a real Christmas song. So for instance, have you ever read all the words to O Holy Night? Go do that this Advent. Read those words. Or what child is this? Read those words or O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the one we just sang, the great Advent song that I love. It helps us really prepare and focus on what we're talking about. I was just talking with the West earlier, and this time of year, do you hear that sucking sound that happens? You know, and it just everything where our kids schools and buy this, and, and, and it's, there's just sucking sound. And when you read these lyrics and really focus on what we're called to focus on in Advent, it helps us kind of go against this sucking sound that draws us into the busyness. We're going to actually talk about songs all Advent, and I want to tell you about the first Christmas songs. I think they're the best Christmas songs. There's four of them, and they were written 700 years before the very first Christmas. They said something. They proclaimed something powerful. They were not cheesy, in my opinion, uh, and it was Isaiah that wrote these. And if you haven't heard of them, they're called the servant songs. People started calling them in the mid-1800s the servant songs uh, because each one we're going to look at every week all the way through Christmas talks about this coming servant. Isaiah uses that phrase. And, and he, each one tells us an attribute of the servant, the one who will come. He talks about, you know, 700 years in advance, one will come, this servant, and he has different attributes. And that's what we're going to look at. And that's what's going to guide us all the way through Advent, through Christmas, and beyond. I'm excited about this journey because I think it's going to prepare us in a special way for the birth of Christ. So before we go too much further on this journey, let me pray. Lord God, I pray a special prayer this season that we be able to breathe a bit deeper and slow down and pay great attention to the fact that you're at work in this world, that you're present that there's hope even in situations that feel hopeless. And that the prophet Isaiah uh, made a prophecy that still stands true about your coming and your coming again, that, that we want to have a posture of waiting and expectancy. And God, we do live in a sense in great darkness and we're longing for a great light. And God, we think that's you. And so we're grateful for this season that we ask that you would be with us as we walk in these coming weeks. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Okay, here's the first song, the first servant song, Isaiah 42. We'll put it on the screen or you can look at it in your phone. And we're just gonna look at four verses. You're gonna see a theme of justice. And so here's where it starts. Verse one. Here is my servant. This is the prophet Isaiah talking about the one that will come, Christ. Here is my servant whom I, who I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. So in the beginning of Isaiah, if you read through the whole prophecy or the book of Isaiah, you would see this term servant shows up. And what Isaiah is talking about in the beginning is the servant is actually Israel, the nation of Israel. 
But there's a problem if you read through Isaiah. It's a reason why he keeps speaking to the nation of Israel. They've dropped the ball. They were supposed to live out the mission of God. They had a clear mission, and they got all lost in different places. They turned inward. They quit looking up to God. And so now what we're going to pay attention to is Isaiah makes this prophecy about a servant that he is sending. It's a new servant. And this new servant, the Messiah, Christ, will fulfill the mission that Israel dropped the ball on. And so that's what these songs talk about. So here's this first claim. If you look at verse 1 that I just read, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one. And if you skip down, it says, he will bring justice to the nations. Okay, so the one that they're being told about that will come one day, they don't know when, is going to be a justice bringer to the nations. That means everywhere. Not to just to this little clique of holy people. But he's going to be a justice bringer to every nook and cranny of the globe, of, of society. Now, here's why I want to pause for a second. As you can tell, justice is going to be the main theme of this song. I think biblical justice and justice in, in general is really misunderstood in our culture, and it's divisive. Because when I say justice, uh, I think people can get confused. What do you mean by that? And, and so... For some people, um, they're, they're not quite sure what it means. And so here's what we're going to do. And I usually don't preach this way, but I'm going to tell you where we're going. We're going to answer these questions. What is justice? Why should we long for it? How does Jesus do justice? And how do we do justice? So let's start with the first one. What is biblical justice? Now, some people think they've told me it's a liberal agenda, right? Right? That, that social justice stuff, it's just a liberal agenda. It's Robin Hood, take from the rich, give to the poor. That's not biblical justice. Or some might say it's this form of justice where it's like wielding power on top of someone until they do what you think is just or right by force. That's not justice. I was a criminal justice major in college, learning the law and breaking the law at the same time. And... Um, I remember, like, the guys that I lived with thought I was cool because I was learning the law and I used it so I could get them out of trouble, right? So the campus police would come and be like, guys, guys, I'll talk to them. And I'd get my knucklehead friends out of trouble. And so what justice was for me was, if it could benefit me and my buddies, then that's justice was served, right? That's not justice. That's a terrible view of justice. To me, justice is not a partisan issue. Justice is a spiritual issue. It's a main attribute of God. It's a main mission of Christ. It's one of the top five themes in all of Scripture is justice. And, and here's a definition I want to give you. It basically means this, what ought to be. When you talk about biblical justice, it's what ought to be. And so how do we get that? We've done this before in church, but I want to keep doing it because I think it's helpful. Let's go back to the very beginning of Genesis. And what happens in Genesis? In Genesis, as, as God created things, everyone was equal. There was no oppression. But then something happened. Sin entered the picture. Things were as they ought to be. And then sin enters the picture. And the first marital argument ever happens between Adam and Eve. And then the rest is history. We start to see how sin affects this thing that God said, wait, this is how it ought to be. And then God addresses this sin and, and he sends the servant, the one he's talking about, to reestablish justice. So why did Jesus come? To reestablish justice, to get things back to how they ought to be. And so this word, I love it. It's a great Hebrew word in scripture that shows up a bunch. The word for justice is mishpat. Everyone say mishpat. Oh, nice. That's good. Justice. That's all, that's all it means. But as you know, words like shalom and mishpat, these great Hebrew words have deep meaning and richness to them. And this one, it means justice, and it has this retributive uh, definition to it. So basically, there's a consequence. Like in my home, there's a consequence. In a lot of homes, there's a consequence. You know, if you don't do this thing you're asked to do, there's a consequence. If you don't study for the test, there's a consequence. But then the second thing that you see in Mishpat is restorative justice. 
And there was actually a court that was doing this that was working with teenagers and not just trying to give retributive justice, meaning you have to pay a fine or do community service. But they wanted them to look eyeball to eyeball with the person they hurt in their crime and to see that they were human and to talk out what they did wrong to try to restore the situation. So retributive justice and restorative justice is Mishpat gets at both of those things. Uh, I remember in high school, I had to do a little hard time in uh, in school suspension, ISS as they call it. I'm not sure what the crime was that time. Um, but they said that you went into this room and there was an ISS teacher. They didn't teach anything. They just watched the inmates. And um, as I was put in my little cubicle, I was disturbing the other inmates in in-school suspension. And they put this a cardboard structure over me um, that went around all sides and over the top so I couldn't bother anyone else. It was the most miserable experience of my life. You should have just expelled me, but I had to stay in this little box and do all my homework for that day twice, right? And so I think about like retributive justice. Okay, so I had to pay for the crime that I created in Ms. Joyner's English class. But it would have been helpful looking back if they would have had me sit down with Miss Joyner and look her in the eyeballs and say, hey, Nathan, do you know what it feels like when you disrupt every single English class in your ninth grade English class? But that didn't happen. But that would have helped me more than just stuffing me in in-school suspension. I think some of you are shocked that a pastor just said he was in in-school suspension. There's hope for all of us people. <laughs> but if there was more restorative work with that teacher, I think that would have been helpful for someone like me. Now, let me give you an example that's maybe um, what well, is deeper and probably more important than me in in-school suspension. Uh, it's the case of Botham John that happened in uh, Dallas, Texas. And maybe you read about this in the news. But Botham was sitting on the second floor of his apartment, uh, African-American man, he was eating ice cream. And a, and a white cop thought she was coming into her floor and she was coming into the wrong floor and she thought it was her apartment. So she thought when she saw this man that he was intruding, and she shot him, and he died. And then all over the news was this scene, which is Botham's brother, Brant. And there, we've been in a lot of dialogue about this with our, uh, racial, um, or our racial dialogue group that we've had with uh, three black churches, three white churches. We've been talking about this case for four weeks. And one of the things that was so powerful to me was that Brant, the brother, was sitting up there in court and he begged the judge. He said, can I go hug her? Can I go hug the woman who killed my innocent brother? And as he was doing that, he said, I want her to know God. I want her life to be restored. I want her to know, you know, the peace and truth of Jesus Christ. And he's crying and he goes and hugs this woman. The judge gives her a Bible. So all these things are happening at the same time. And, and you're wondering... What moved Brant to do that on behalf of his brother? See, I think he has this longing for restorative justice, mishpat, to go along the side of the retributive justice. Because here's what one of my African-American friends in town said. He said, white people were looking at that and saying, that's the gospel, that, that he forgave, the brother forgave the woman. And my friend Chris said, nah, that's a part of the gospel. Forgiveness is part of the gospel. But he said, someone has to pay. So when you think about the gospel of Jesus Christ, who paid? Christ. In this, there needs to be retributive justice that, that the woman needed to pay for her crime. And I think she knew that. And some would say she didn't pay enough. But what Brant wanted that got everyone's attention is he wanted to experience restorative justice. That the gospel is forgiveness. The gospel is justice. Someone has to pay for the sins. But it's also restorative. That's the gospel and that we're working towards, and that's a long road to go for them, but they're on this journey of working towards restoration. All of that is a product of forgiveness and, and justice. So why should you long for justice? Why should you leave here tonight saying, oh, we want justice in our world? Here's why. The result of biblical God, jesus -y justice is shalom. It's this other great word we've talked about. It's completeness, it's wholeness, 
It, it's, it's more than just peace. And you know what shalom means? Universal flourishing. So this is what Jesus started. When we, we celebrate that Jesus came into this world, we see that he started restoring people, restoring things. And he will come again, the promise is, to finish that work to finish the restoration. That's Advent. Advent is as much focusing on the second coming of Christ as it is the first coming of Christ. So we wait with hope and we we wait with expectancy for Christ to return. Do you believe this? Do you believe this, that Christ will come again and restore us and restore all things? There's great hope for me in that belief that God has not left us hanging, but that he will return in glory. And so here's another question we have. How does Jesus do justice? Now this Isaiah section to me blew my mind this week to show us how does Jesus do justice? Does Jesus do justice with a sword? No. Does he do it with force? No. Look at what scripture says in verses two through three. It says he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed, like I think of a sea oat, um, will not break. And a smoldering wick, like of a candle, he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He doesn't yell. It says a bruised reed, that word also means to crush. He doesn't crush. Uh, Snuff out, he doesn't blow out a candle that's already kind of barely smoldering. And what that means is some of us right now in this room are bruised reeds. Life has been so hard on us. We are bruised reeds. We are little candles and we're barely lit. And Jesus doesn't come by and go, right? Or if you're bent over and you can barely stand up, he doesn't, he doesn't come push you down. Folks, Jesus Christ is never a burden, but a blessing, especially to those who feel oppression. This one that that Isaiah is talking about, well, one day this servant will say, come to me, all you who are weary. I'll give you rest. Think about that. He's not pushing down on top of people. He's inviting. And so here's what I want you to hear tonight about injustice. Whatever injustice looks like in our world, in your world, where you live. Injustice, as scripture is telling us, crushes people. It snuffs them out. It blows out their candle. But the justice of Christ, Jesus' justice, causes flourishing. When you experience the the goodness and truth of Christ, humans flourish. And so it's not this burden, but it's this blessing. And so what Jesus does is is he brings justice with humility, not force. And the scripture says he does it in faithfulness. It's this steadiness that Jesus will bring this justice and start to change things as he walks among the people and he lives among the people, we start to see justice. So what does it look like for us? How do we do justice? If the command is, let's go do justice, and I get that from Micah 6, 8, the prophet, who says, you know, what does the Lord require of you? The Lord requires that you act justly, that you do justice, and that you love mercy, and that you walk humbly with your God. Do you act justly? What does that look like? Do you do justice? Mishpat, when you see the word mishpat in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, it's associated with this four classes of people that are called the quartet of the poor. Do you know who the quartet of the poor are? The widow, the orphan, the immigrant, and the poor. All four of them in scriptural times, in Isaiah's times, they were powerless, they were vulnerable, and all four groups actually struggled to eat, right? Many of them were groups that were actually starving. That was called the quartet of the poor. And you might fast forward to today and say, is it a quartet? Is it more than just a quartet? People would say you could put the elderly in that group, the homeless, the refugee, Maybe a single mom. But here's what I want you to hear about those groups. If you're thinking about someone you know that fits one of those categories. When you and when I and when the church helps a vulnerable person flourish, you are doing justice. Does that make sense? 
When you as an individual or we as the church help vulnerable people flourish, or that is called doing justice. That's what it means to do justice. And so if, if you go back here and you buy some of these or give money towards these ministries that we support, guess what all these ministries do? Justice. Open Hands Farm is a justice ministry, a mishpat ministry that helps people flourish who are not flourishing. And then there's the Help Hub. There's Vigilant Hope. There's Verbo in uh, Nicaragua. All these people are on the ground helping people flourish, and we as the church come alongside them and help them flourish. And so here's a question for you uh, this Advent. What does it look like for you in your situation, at your job, in your neighborhood, with your family, in this city? What does it look like for you to act justly? What does it look like for you to do justice? It's part of our biblical command. Now, here's a little tension or a rub I see within the conversation of justice because justice has been real trendy. That over, and I don't think that's the worst thing in the world, but anytime something is trendy, sometimes it loses uh, some of its meaning. And so there's this phrase called slacktivism. Have you ever heard of slacktivism? Here's an example of slacktivism, uh, this little meme. Look, Daddy, we're changing the world one tweet at a time. I thought it was funny. Um, slacktivism says I'm going to click a like towards this thing, and I feel like I've done something. I'm going to post an article on, on sex trafficking or oppression or something, and whew, I'm glad I'm helping. But are we? Are we doing justice by just posting things on our social media? And even before social media, uh, a lot of Christians are good at this thing, where we talk about something so much, we think we've actually done something. Anyone ever been like that? Right, we talk, we talk, we talk. Like, yeah, we did that. And we're like, I don't think we did that. We just like to talk about it. We like to research it. But what Mike is saying is act, go for it, do justice. Let me give you an example. This is Proverbs 31, 8. It says this, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. I've seen little children in elementary school speak up for those who can't speak. I've seen good bosses speak up for those who can't speak. And whether we like this or not, that sometimes uh, certain races have to speak up for other races who don't have a seat at the table or genders or whatever it might be, that we have to speak up for those who don't have a voice at the table where some of us have power, where some of us have influence. And so we speak up for those who can't speak. What is, what is spiritual maturity when it comes to this? It's not speaking up on behalf of yourself to me, it's when you start looking out amongst your own community and in our world and speaking up for others where unjust or unjust things are happening to other people, not just to yourself. That's, to me, a sign of spiritual maturity. And so think real quick. Who pops into your mind right now when I ask you these questions? Who can't speak because they don't have the position to that you know? Or who is vulnerable that you know, that you say this person right now is vulnerable? Or maybe think this way, who in your life that God has put in your path is not flourishing? And then ask this question, why? Why? And what can you do about it? What is your response? Sometimes we look at these great, like this ministry I love called International Justice Mission, and it deals with like corrupt governments all across the world to, to fight against sex trafficking. And we think, I can't do that. I'm not an attorney or some kind of retired special agent. But I think there's everyday justice that happens in our schools and workplace. It happens on social media. It happens in our neighborhoods. And I think we're called to respond to it. The, the Old Testament writers, and I want to close with this, they, they call God by a certain title, and I love it. He's called the father to the fatherless and the defender of widows. What does that tell you about the heart of God? And if you are the fatherless or a widow, what do you think that verse means to you, to them? Our God, don't forget this, our God identifies with the powerless and not only identifies with them, but he takes up their cause. And so this attribute of God, this justice piece of God, it should shape us as Hope Community Church. I think it should shape us as individuals. And as we live into this, 
doing justice, seeking justice, we're going to start to see the world as it ought to be, which is the definition of justice. You know when we say the Lord's Prayer, Christ's kingdom come, His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a picture of justice. That's a picture of flourishing. That's a picture of hope. Let's pray. Lord God, I ask, I guess it's a bold prayer, that we would be a church that doesn't just think about what is right for ourselves, but that you would open our eyes to see issues or systems or places that are unjust, people taking, being taken advantage of, people who need someone to walk alongside them to help them flourish. God, what does that look like? Show us that person's face or that group's face. Lord, give us the courage to actually do something and not just post something online, but to respond to places that seem hurting or broken and that need your mishpat, your restorative and retributive work, Lord Jesus. God, we want to be people of justice and we need your help. We need your eyes to see it. We need your spirit to respond to these things. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.